Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus in Our Mental Health. Today is June 8th, 2022. Uh, I'm Ken Burtis, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa in the North Shore. Now, yesterday when I looked at the New York Times, the 7th of June, I saw some very disturbing statistics, unfortunately. Uh, Hawaii ascended to number one in average new cases per week. Uh, let me explain that a little bit, okay? The New York Times looks at the last seven days and sees how many new cases per 100,000 people in our population. That way we can compare how Hawaii is doing to the big states like California and Texas and New York and all that. And unfortunately, this week, Hawaii led all 58 states, not 58, excuse me, all 50 states as far as average new cases in coronavirus. Now, this sort of follows the pattern that we've been seeing as far as the coronavirus movement from east to west. Uh, right now, we're seeing the Northeast and the Midwest uh, getting some relief from, from their high uh, surge numbers just recently. Uh, and the surge is moving west, uh, the west coast is up, and we're up the most, like I say. Now, this is really difficult. It's difficult for us because it's been an emotional roller coaster here in Hawaii for two years. Uh, it's been very hard for us to keep going back and forth between masking and unmasking. Uh, and we're still having a hard time. Uh, most people are not masked anymore. And uh, we've got a lot of tourists coming in and a lot of people who are anxious to get out of the house. I know that because a lot of them come to the North Shore when they get out of their house. Um, plus we have the fact that we're looking at these incredible mass uh, shootings that are going around uh, in our country. Uh, these contribute to an emotional upheaval that is very difficult uh, to deal with. And luckily today, I have my good friend, Jerry Brennan here. Uh, Jerry is a clinical psychologist uh, who lives in Hawaii Kai and practices out there. And his specialty is dealing with emotions like the stuff that we're going through and doing it with thoughts. So without any further ado, I want to uh, welcome Jerry to our program and uh, introduce him to you. So Jerry, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. My passion is helping people, and I hope I can be helpful today. I know you will be. And uh, we'll start off with, like I said, if you could start, if you could tell us a little bit about how you work on taking thoughts and cognitions and helping people with their emotions. Right. Well, sometimes I start out asking people a few questions and then help them understand uh, that their thinking is a little bit off and that we can switch it and they'll feel better. So typically I start out asking a person a question. Uh, let's see here. I, so I have a little checklist here and I ask people yes or no to the following questions. And the first question is, sometimes others make me angry. And what do you say to that one? Well, that's a true or false question, right? So uh, right. yes or no. Yeah, I'm, oh, yes or no. Okay, so I'm guessing most people would say yes. Uh, people do piss me off. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd say 95% of people say sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes others make me angry. Mm -hmm. And so what I tell them is, nope, that's wrong. And they go, what? <laughs> and I say, well, here's how it works. If somebody says something to you or does something to you, like if somebody walked into my, my home office here and broke the window and punched me in the nose and I'm laying on the floor thinking that son of a I would feel angry, right? Me too. Right. But if I was laying on the floor thinking, my gosh, she's going to kill me, then I would feel afraid. Or I might think, what can I do to calm this guy down before he, he hurts me? Okay, I might look for mm -hmm. a solution. So my th whenever, whenever anything happens, there's always a thought. And that thought is going to kill me, or damn, he busted my window, or how can I, you know, how can I calm him down? 
Those are three different thoughts. Mm -hmm. So even in extreme situations, you might have a different thought than somebody else. And those thoughts will result in different feelings. I think he's going to, I think if I think on that son of a then I'll feel angry. If I think he's going to kill me. I'm going to feel afraid. If I think, what should I do? I, I'm starting to problem solve. So my thoughts, your thoughts cause your feelings, not what happens even in extreme situations. Like another one, if somebody, if my house is burned down and I grab my cat, and my wife, and I'm standing outside thinking, thank God we got out. Or damn, my house is burning down. Totally different reaction based upon my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So the way you think about things is what really, really matters. And you can learn to control that. And I don't know, we can end the show here. <laughs> Well, of course, the uh, the real kicker is how do we control them, you know, and especially today when our thoughts seem out of control, it just seems everything seems so overwhelming and we don't seem to have any solutions of what we can do. And the people who are leading us don't seem to have many solutions either. And so we're faced with, uh, my God, we're stuck here and things are bad and we're stuck in the bad. And uh, so how do we uh, turn it around and think all those uh, different thoughts, especially the good thoughts about, thank God I got out of the fire. <laughs> right. Well, there's a bunch of different things we can do. Uh, one is uh, realize that your thoughts are causing your feelings. That's step number one, to realize this fact. It's a fact, yeah. it's the way I think. And if we grew up, in an abusive childhood, we're probably going to overreact to these kind of things and get angry. If we didn't, we'll have a different reaction. We had, you know, gentle parents. When we did something wrong, they'd go, "Oh my gosh, we got a mess here. How can we clean this up?" Instead of go go to time out for two hours and or or get spanked or slapped or something. We we've we've all had different experiences, and when people do things to us, one of my big questions is, why do they do it? And usually the answer is they had a bad childhood. Yeah. And the thing just keeps repeating itself. And that's the really discouraging thing. Uh, I know a lot of people who had abusive parents. And they said to me, when they came to me, they said, I will never be abusive to my kids because my parents were abusive to me. But when things got really tough, things got really tight and things got going crazy, we reverted, our people reverted to what they knew best and that was to control the situation with violence. And so they, they go back to the thing that they knew rather than the thing they wanted to. And that's really discouraging. Right. We're creatures of habit, for sure. Mm -hmm. What we learned, we learned, and we've got to get some new habits. So uh, how do you help your clients get those new habits? That's, that's okay. a key. And I know you do that really well. <laughs> right. So the second question I sometimes ask them is, Sometimes expressing anger helps me get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And they usually say, yes, yeah, true. And the correct answer is false. Whatever you practice, you get better at. So if you could practice it saying you, you will get better at doing that. People, I don't know if you know that some people swear a lot, right? Yeah. And so that helps them get rid of it, right? No. If they practice it, they get better at it. If you spend a lot of time swearing, you become a better swearer. <laughs> so pr practice makes imperfect. <laughs> and they don't realize that that's the key. They, they you know, they, they're falling into that. And uh, right. so we bring that up to them and they say, what? <laughs> so we got to find another way to think about things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because our thoughts is a problem and we got to find some new ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes some practice because we've had a lifetime of thinking this other way. And how do we change that? I have a whole bunch of handouts helping people change their thoughts. Like we have this, I have this thing I call the fallacy of the shoulds. People do, will do what I think they should. That's going to get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People do what they want to do, not what they should do. 
People don't do what I think they should, only what's rewarding and reinforcing for them. I can't expect people to act the way I want them to. People can't read my mind. People don't do what I think they should, only what their values and needs dictate. Shoulds are my needs and values pushed on somebody else. So if we, there's a whole bunch of different ways to think about this thing to get rid of that fallacy of the shoulds, people expecting people to do what they should do. That's really hard. I know that you uh, work with uh, couples as well as individuals sometimes. And uh, the for every time, you know, I wish I had a dollar for every time a couple comes in and uh, says, well, we love each other, but uh, things are not working out because the other person is not uh, doing what I think they should be doing. Right. And you walk into a relationship thinking, well, I'll change the other person. You know, I mean, the, the other person's got some problems, but I love him or I love her and we'll change him. Well, <laughs> that doesn't seem to work very well with couples therapy. I, what's your experience in that regard as far as help, trying to heap the, help them uh, have different expectations of their partner and of the, the people in the world? Well, I can't expect people to act the way I want them to. I can't, you know, uh, but I, I definitely feel I should get paid double for couples therapy. <laughs> I won't argue with that, that's for sure. <laughs> but we, we, we need to calm down and we got to realize that uh, uh, one of my favorite saying is uh, excrement, excrement distributes ram randomly. I don't know if you've heard of that one before. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I like the way you put it. It's a very nice, uh, Not, nice way, to put way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other way is happens okay yes. <laughs> i don't like swearing too much so i try to stay away from that so i say excrement distributes randomly i like that yeah and it's it's true uh bad things will happen and good things will happen too however there are many many good things that are happening and there's a few bad things and if we our thoughts cause our feelings if we focus on the house burning down we'll feel bad if we focus on the fact that we got out and saved the cat too we feel much better. So we've got to focus on the positives. I totally agree. You know, one of the things that uh, I would, would like you to, to go back to for a second, if we could, is that idea of changing habits. Uh, you know, I, I work with people and they say, well, yeah, I'll try that. And they try it once or twice, but then they forget about it and uh, they go back to their normal habits. How do we, how do we keep people to develop new habits, things that will stay with them rather than They'll try once or twice and they'll forget about it. I don't know if you know how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb. Oh, I, I'm afraid to hear this answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so I've got to get the client to cooperate here that they want to make some changes. But uh, there are so many uh, wonderful things to be grateful for. Yeah, there are. And then there's a few things that are junk, that's for sure. Yeah. And we have a choice to, to pick. And some people, like I kind of have a passion in life to try to help people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my focus goes towards that instead of, you know, that my car broke down or something like that. I'm thinking about how to help this person. So having a passion or a mission in life is really, a, really a wonderful thing to do to have something to focus on other than me, 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 you know, what, what, what can I do? And you know, what do I That's enjoy true. doing? I like to play football or I like to help people or I like, I'm an artist or, you know, what do you, you got to find some of your passions in life. And when you're feeling bad, jump over there and do your passion. Absolutely. What happens sometimes when you can't do your passion? I know one of your passions is badminton. And right. sometimes it becomes, <laughs> A little difficult. Uh, I know you've had, you know, you haven't been able to play uh, for a while, and that has to be hard. Uh, well, I there's more to, more than badminton in my life for sure. Like coming and talking on the show is, I haven't even thought about badminton today. Oh, that's terrific! Great. <laughs> well, that makes me feel better. That's terrific. Yeah, I know. Yeah, when you can't when you can't engage in your passions, one of the things that some people have done during the coronavirus is develop new passions. Um, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that's certainly an avenue we can uh, take a look at. 
have you had much success with people trying new things during the coronavirus or during these difficult times? Uh, yeah, well, there's various things you can do. Let's see, I wrote down a bunch of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but we have some beautiful beaches in Hawaii. <laughs> Truly. Well, maybe taking a walk on the beach or even better going swimming in the ocean there. We have a beautiful ocean. The water's kind of warm nowadays. Or take a walk in the woods or work in your garden. Or another, another one is connection with other people. Reach out to have some friends. Yeah. I miss my uh, traveling. I'm with the Rotary Club and I go to different countries and help people in other countries, poor people typically. I haven't been able to do that, but it's caused me to think about the times that I went and these poverty stricken people that you know have one water pump for the whole village or something like that. And everybody has to go to the water pump to pump water. They can't go to the bathroom and turn a faucet on or the kitchen. And these people all go to the pump together and they're all hanging out together and the kids are playing together and it's lovely. They're happier than we are. And so there's so there's, I see these other countries where people have far less than we do, but they're actually, the community is more cooperative and they're more connected to each other. And so get some people connections, join a club or something like that. Or, uh, you know, I have my badminton club, you know, and I, I don't get to see them and that's unfortunate, but I, I have other organizations with my Rotary Club. We're still meeting and working together. And, I'm still playing ping pong, although I, maybe I shouldn't be, but I've been playing ping pong a bit. <laughs> well, that's great, yeah. I'm so, you know, uh, I saw a movie. Oh, going yeah. to church or. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Listening to music or get your hobby going or go out and help somebody. You know, I was, think, I was thinking about you the other day because of, you know, your Rotary Club connections. I hope we have time for you to tell us a little bit more about that. But I saw this movie called. Uh, uh, Lunana, uh, Yak in the Classroom. It was up for uh, Best Picture, Best Foreign Film last year. Uh, and it takes place in Bhutan, mm. supposedly at the remotest village in the world. And a teacher goes out there at the beginning of the film and things are primitive to say the least. I mean, yep. <laughs> I have been, I've, been, I've been to Bhutan, I know. Uh, it's an amazing place and it's an amazing film. That, that, the scenery is like Hawaii in a way that it's so beautiful, different, yep. a different beauty, but uh, it's incredible. But they have nothing that we have that sort of takes our attention away. And they can just really focus on the beauty, which is incredible there. And it's it's incredible working with the kids there. It's this guy goes up there to teach, to be the only teacher in the village. And he teaches these young kids. And it's uh, it's just incredibly heartwarming beautiful thing. They say if you've only been to one country, it's like you've only read one page in the book. Yeah. You should definitely go see some other countries and get a better perspective on our own by seeing the, how these other people do it. And Bhutan is one of the happiest countries in the world. They have uh, uh, carbon, carbon, carbon positive or whatever negative. They have water generation electricity and they sell electricity to India because they have extra so they produce more than they need and they sell it to other countries and uh, the roadway is going way back and the remote areas are beautiful they paved them all everybody's got free education and free medical care and it's an amazing country and yet it's very very poor they're not rich like we are but they're happier than we are because they have this community and they work together. I totally That's agree. And, and I'm envious. Beautiful nature. Yeah. And I'm envious of you being able to uh, travel the world. I know you've seen a lot more countries than I have. Yeah. Any other experiences uh, that you've really enjoyed uh, in your travels with the Rotary Club? Well, uh, the one in, well, the one in Cambodia where we went to a remote village where we had installed a water pump for the village. So they had one water pump for the whole village and everybody's gathered around the village and the kids are splashing in the water and playing and being happy. And everybody lives in a, just a little um, wood hut or something, you know, and they have dry seasons and everything's barren and dust. And, but 
little school was there. You can, you can see the whole school just standing there, you know, a little bitty school, and they, but the kids are playing and learning things and everybody's happy. I just couldn't believe it. One thing that you said that really resonated with me was uh, when we're faced with all these difficulties and like when we turn on the news, for instance, and we right. see all the terrible things that are going on. Yeah. And one of the things that you brought out was remembering, uh, going back to our memories of these wonderful moments like you're talking about right. uh, in your world travels. Uh, that gets us away from all this negativity and I think uh, allows us to come up with a better uh, perspective, like uh, our better perspective and our thoughts rather than uh, being at the mercy of our emotions. Right. There, yeah, there's so much to be grateful for. I had this one thing here is first had to write down what the seven wonders of the world were. Well, oh, yeah, I saw that. Tell us about that. Yeah. So usually people think, you know, the seven wonders of the world are like Egypt's Great Pyramids and the Taj Mahal and the Grand Canyon and the Panama Canal and the Empire State Building and China's Great Wall and St. Peter's Basilica. But this little girl wrote this thing out of the seven world wonders of the world that she thought were to be able to touch people, to taste, to see, to hear, to feel, to laugh. And number seven was to love. Those are the seven wonders of the world. And we all have those things. Yeah, and from the mouth of the younger comes the wisdom, that's for sure. Yeah. And it, it really moved me when I, when I heard, heard that. And uh, I know that you work with your clients on trying to adjust their perspectives and therefore help them come up with better thoughts to govern uh, uh, this e during this emotional time. Well, gratitude is a big one, being grateful for all the things you do have. I mean, you got a heart that beats, you know, a hundred times a minute. And it's been doing that your whole life. Be thankful for that. If it stopped for a little while, you'd be dead. <laughs> Truly. And your eyelid is blinking, you know, the same the eyelid blinks a hundred times a, a minute. Well, and Jerry, we're coming, we're coming up on like uh, about four and a half minutes left in the show. Oh, okay. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what you think are the, uh, you've already told us about gratitude as being so important. What else uh, to you and uh, is been really important in helping people change their thoughts to, uh, to give them a better perspective and uh, less at the mercy of all these negative emotions? Well, I certainly think just the simple one of deep breathing exercises or some kind of meditation or which of course walking by the, in the woods or at the beach calms you down a little bit. But if you just do some deep breathing exercises, like a lot of people smoke cigarettes in order to re relax, right? <laughs> you know, that's crazy. <laughs> but cigarettes have nicotine in them, a stimulant. Yeah, but people time. report that they're more relaxed when they smoke a cigarette. And I think they are because they're doing a deep breathing exercise when they're smoking their cigarette. They take, they breathe in for about 10 seconds, they go, then they hold for about 10 seconds, and they breathe back out again. Just don't do it with a cigarette, because a cigarette's bad for you, but if you just do deep breathing exercises or some kind of meditation things or, or prayer at, at church or all those kind of things help you calm down a little bit, and, and then you can start focusing on all the things you have to be thankful for. I mean, you're alive. <laughs> be thankful you're alive. Your elbow may hurt or something like that, or I'm having some knee problems, but I'm still here. I can yeah. still do one heck of a lot of things. I can't play badminton, but I'm here. Yeah, exactly. I'm happy. I love the, uh, you know, when you talked about uh, the lungs and that, if we could just get people to breathe like they were smoking cigarettes without the cigarettes, like you yep. say, it's think huge. of all the healthy young lungs we would have in this country. Right. Think, think of all the reduction in, uh, lung cancer and all the other and COPD and all these other type of things that because I ran a, a tobacco cessation program uh, uh, not ran it but supervised it for many years and uh, God if we could do that yeah. that would be wonderful well walking in the woods or on the beach exercise is another huge health it's healthy for you not, not only for your mind but also for your body one of the things I really liked I got a friend out uh not that far from you, he's in Kailua. And uh, 
you know, when things get a little tight, he just says, well, uh, it's time for a walk on the beach. And uh, that gives him the break, like the cigarette break. You know, one of the nice things about cigarettes is not only breathing, but you get to take a break from whatever is stressing you out. And he does it with a walk on the beach, like you're saying. And, and like you're saying, our beaches are wonderful. It's one of the things that has kept me up on the North Shore for over 40 years is to be able to go out and just walk on the beach. And I know that uh, out in Hawaii, Kai, you do the same thing, and, uh, and except you can also go out on the water <laughs> with your yeah. kayak, which is wonderful. Yeah, fine. Fine. And, and find something you love to do, you know, that's if that's going walking or that's, uh, you know, sailing a sailboat or whatever, doesn't matter what, find something you love to do or artistic kinds of things or helping people or adopting cats or feeding the homeless or, you know, there's all kinds of, find a mission. <clears throat> there are two really, the two most important qualities in life, you know, are perseverance. So, you know, don't give up. And then the second most important thing is uh, knowing when to quit. Okay. So, so pick something well, out, give it your best shot. And if it doesn't work, quit and do something else. You know, those are two important qualities. Keep trying to do the wrong thing and you'll keep being unhappy. Right? I'm so, with you, Jerry. You know, and we're now down to under a minute. So I wanted to, again, thank you for being on the show with me and thank you for sharing uh this perspective on how to deal with all this negativity and i think you've given a lot of people some things to think about and i really appreciate you being here right uh, if you can fix it fix it if you can't fix it let it go yeah absolutely <laughs> hanging on to something you can't fix is ridiculous yeah there's so absolutely. many things you can fix waste don't waste your time trying to fix something you can't fix find something you can fix i mean this world needs you that's right i totally agree and again, thank you. And I wanted to thank everybody who, who uh, tuned in to this show. And if you have any questions uh, about what we talked about today, uh, anything that you would like to add as comments, please uh, let Think Tech Hawaii know. And I'd also like to thank, thank the staff at Think Tech Hawaii uh, with Jay Fidel and Haley and Michael and everybody else who is such a great help to us here as well. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us and to everybody and especially my friend, Jerry. Aloha. Okay, and shut this off and go out and have some fun. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.